All right, welcome to this afternoon's work session. First order of business is to see if any commissioner would like to discuss any preliminary items for the next BLC meeting. All right, hearing none, first uh, work session discussion item is e civis Grant Management System. I believe Ms. Singleton. Oh, no? Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. okay. I'm just gonna... Dr. Smith. Yes, sir. Good evening, Chairman, Commissioner, Vice Chair, Madam, Madam Vice Chair coming in. Um, thank you for allowing OPM to present ECVIS Grants uh, Management System again to you uh, with your consideration. We hope that this pre presentation that we're doing, um, you would consider us allowing us to have a, us, the county, a countywide grants management system. We're going to have our um, senior grants analyst to do a presentation, and then we will answer any questions to the best of our ability that you guys may have. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Good evening, Vice Chair, Chairman, and Commissioner. My goal today is to give you the benefits of why Clayton County needs a grant management system. It is essential that we keep track of not only the financial part of the grant, we need to keep track of the performance of the grant. With eCVIS, there are two main things that we want to focus on, staying compliant and maximizing grant revenues. Our grant renewal is dependent on the usage and accurate management of our grants. With eCVIS, we can limit our exposure during audits. Currently, we're using a manual process. Everybody has spread, every grant has a spreadsheet, and I don't think that's the most efficient way. Coming from the finance department, I know it's not the most efficient way. A, te a dedicated system would help reduce administrative time would help reduce our exposure to non-compliance. And according to Uniform Grant Code 2 CFR 200, that's something that we must do. Now let's talk about maximizing grant revenue. Currently, when we pursue grants, it's very cumbersome and time consuming. We have to search through multiple databases to find funding, and that's available funding and we have to see if it's a great fit for us. We have to read through lengthy solicitation to see if they will um, match our goals, and we have to coordinate those grants between cross departments. Time is limited because it's, uh, when you apply for a grant, you have a certain amount of time to get all the requirements they need, and if we're spending all of our time researching, how are we getting the funding that we need? Helping to reduce compliance burden will result in more time to pursue new funding, and it will allow for us to be more effective with the collaboration of departments and them getting the grants that they're seeking. Next slide. I'm going to keep staying on the maximize grant revenue because I'm a financial person. So currently, we have 80 grants that we manage across all departments. And with eCVIS, we'll improve our collaboration and transparency between the departments. Um, our current and temporary, I'm going to say temporary for a reason, grant portfolio is $80 million. Now, if you take out the $67 million, that's ARPA and CARES, our grant portfolio is only $14 million. Wouldn't you like to have an $80 million grant portfolio? I did a little research and I found out in 2019, we applied for 29 grants. Of the 29 grants that we applied for, we did receive 25. That is a great number. But I focus on why didn't we receive those four? Were we not <coughs> in compliance with the time of searching for those grants, getting the application in? Um, did we go out and seek grants that are not fit for us? We don't know. With eCVIS, we'll be able to track that kind of information on why we're not getting the grants that we go after. Also, 
A little known fact is with eCVIS, there are 22 new grants that are uploaded into the system every day. So that to me is 22 not two, every day, 22 new opportunities that we can get grant funding and we can leave our general fund alone. So this is the grant application process. We research grant opportunities. We ensure that we meet those, re those requirements. We prepare grant applications. We submit and we wait. We wait and we pray. The reason why I circled research, the grant opportunities, because I just want to give you a little information. We can spend up to 20 hours a week searching the multiple engines looking for grant opportunities. It took my intern an entire week to find a kitchen grant for our extensions department only to produce two options. With eCVIS, I'm positive we would have found a whole lot more options. Time wasted on research is funding opportunities missed. So um, when I started in OPM, I compared these two grant management systems. And the reason why I thought eCVIS would be our better choice, they are a grant management system that's being used and it's designed for state, local, tribal governments. It's cloud-based, which our IT, they helped me when I was making my decision um, to see which one was more compatible with Munis. They are. Their price was much better than Amplifun, and their overall rating was a 4.4 out of 5. With eCVIS, we can integrate the county's financial management system, Munis, to ensure an accurate flow of data and accountability and transparency providing a clear audit trail. With eCVIS, we can, it's a centralized system that the whole county can use, every department, and we'll track the complete life cycle, pre-award, post-award, and sub-recipient management, as well as closeout. So you ask why eCVIS? There are over 1,000 government entities that trust eCVIS to help them modernize, automate, and centralize their grant management process. There are just a few right there. As you can see, there's only one in right now. Currently, there's only one, because I'm sure there's going to be two counties in Georgia that use it. And it helps improve the way they manage their grants. It gives them the ability to create goals and metrics to track the grant performance organizationally and departmentally. It's compatible with MUNIS. And it's a standardized process for each department to manage their grants. Currently, our grants, our departments, some of them are siloed. They go out and they search grants on their own. We find out about them later. With a grant management system, everybody will be notified at one time when any department is seeking a grant. Um, the, um, so right now, Sometimes we have to go through the resolutions to see that there was a grant applied for. Even in finance, you sometimes find out after the fact. We don't want that. We want to be able to know in advance. We want you guys to know in advance as well and to know why they're seeking that grant. And if there's a grant that can help more than one department, another department will be able to see that information and they can collaborate to make sure and ensure we actually get the funding that we're going after. Another thing that I like about eCVIS, um, currently with our grants, we only do a 10% indirect cost. We have the ability to do much more than 10%. We can do as much as 80%, and eCVIS will help us capture those costs when we're going to seek these grants. By not using more than 80%, we're leaving money on the table. Let's talk about compliance and transparency. eCVIS is a direct line of sight that will show how our expenditures and program outcome for Transparry is accounted for. Do we have any insight into what is being pursued or awarded 
on a daily basis and is it meeting our county metrics and goals? We don't know because departments are going out and seeking grants on their own and not notifying either OPM or finance until after the fact. There are built-in internal controls over the process and the compliance requirements. We can reduce audit findings and eSeavers can help build a strategic approach to increased grant funding in alignment with our county's policy goals and priorities. Now, as I mentioned before, right now there's only one county in Georgia using it. Their challenge was Glenn County is a very small county. Clayton County is much bigger than them. Their challenge was too much time spent looking for and reading through RFPs and other funding notifications, having to search for numerous online grant resources to find the funding that they look for, and the lack of a centralized information system to hold all their grants. Their solution when they found eSeavis, they had new grant opportunity alerts. Remember I mentioned earlier, there's 22 alerts that are sent every single day. They used eSeavis to reduce the amount of time to find grants by 50%. And they, this is the best part, so make sure you're listening. Increased alternate revenue by 26% within the first 20 months. All the money that they've increased, it came to about 190,000 in additional funding for their county. If Glenn County can secure 190,000, I'm sure Clayton County can do so much more. But you don't have to listen to me and take my advice. Here's E. Sebus, they'll tell you the rest. Thank you, Celeste. Is there a way that we can make uh, Ryan Baird presenter so that he can share his screen. Ryan Baird is our director of solution architects here at eCivis and uh, we'll talk about the system for about five or ten minutes just kind of show you from an overview standpoint uh, what Clayton County is, is looking at. So. Ryan, can you hear us okay? Yep, it, it uh, asked me to rejoin once I became a panelist. Everyone, I hope, can hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. All right. Let's jump in then. Let me start sharing my screen. Um, there we go. Perfect. Thank you for whoever did that. Okay, it's saying the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So it sounds like there may be one more setting to add me as a uh, as able to screen share, and then we should be able to get started. So left is that? Is there a so selection there? Oh, there we go, making me the host, and we are in business. All right. Can everybody see my screen there? You should be seeing the organization project dashboard. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. The, the, the things that I wanted to highlight for you is how all of this data and the time savings and the additional grants that Celeste was talking about really feed into immediate access reporting and information that is kind of right now probably difficult or very very challenging to get so this this summary here the org dashboard uh, totals up all of your existing projects within the county all of the um, active grants that are being supported uh, by uh, or I'm sorry that are supporting those projects and then the stages of all those various awards um, so right now, grants typically within any organization is, is done in a very disparate way. There may be lots of different processes that people have developed. This allows everybody to work kind of in a, in a, in a, a common method 
to determine what status each grant is in, which ones are being awarded, which ones are not, which ones have been pursued. Uh, they all have, what we'll do is we'll organize each department into its own um, agency where they can pursue, create projects, and uh, aggressively pursue those grant funds. And this is done within the context of your overarching goals and objectives. So the Board of Commissioners, no doubt, has um, some very specific objectives you're trying to achieve, to achieve, to enrich your communities, to further perhaps some business goals, um, connectivity, investments in greater equity and diversity. Uh, you can align all of your grant pursuance to those goals and objectives. So that in addition to just the time savings and the additional grants and the additional job dollars, that's obviously critical, but it'll actually align to the strategic objectives that you have. So you can actually see how grants are impacting your strategic vision, what you've committed to your constituents to do. You can show how grant dollars are moving the needle uh, without having to take funds from just the general fund. This is a, a way to bring in extra dollars in a way that's um, unique to grant opportunities. So that's kind of the end result. After, after, these, after the system is implemented, it's aligned to your strategic objectives. All of that information flows into this uh, dynamically updated dashboard. And how we do that is in this grant research tool, um, we are pulling in data from thousands of different resources on a daily basis. Um, and we, but we make it very easy for the end user to, uh, to access this database and use it. It could be as simple as a few keywords that you can enter in. And they can just run a search on those keywords. We have predetermined categories uh, that align to typical county departments. So whether you're in animal welfare, arts and culture, community development, disaster preparedness, within a couple of clicks, um, users are accessing the grants that are applicable to them. And you're immediately getting a steady flow of new opportunities hitting everybody's inboxes. And so that's one of the first things we'll do in the implementation process is align those search, we call them search agents, to specific areas of need that you're trying to address. Uh, we'll automate those searches. So I'm going to save this into an automated search alert. And now what happens is, is that user will just automatically get a daily list of new grant opportunities that fit their criteria. So. The law enforcement folks would get law enforcement grants, fire folks would get fire grants, you, you get the idea. So it really increases the efficiency of everyone's time. Uh, typically grant staff are people who are not full time doing just grants. They have a limited amount of time that they can spend on a daily basis doing grants. So this allows them to maximize the five or 10 minutes a day that they have to review grant opportunities, determine eligibility, and move forward with those grants that are the most critical. So this page that you're seeing here is an example of a typ typical grant that you might get in eCivis, um, where it comes into your inbox, the user would then be able to review the criteria for the grant. Uh, we summarize each one of these opportunities into the key areas that it will fund, so that within five minutes, you can determine, A, are we eligible? B, is this a good fit? And then you can move forward with selecting the status, determining whether or not you want to actually apply to the grant program. And all that activity is tracked. All of that rolls back up to that greater dashboard I showed you at the beginning, where you can see, as the Board of Commissioners, how many grants have we applied for in the last six months, in the last year? What didn't we apply for? Why didn't we get it? It just gives you a, a much higher degree of visibility into how grants are being pursued, and then you ultimately can influence that and say, you know, we need to focus on grants more in this category or in this area, or let's put our efforts here, and you can really um, uh, choose to expend your, you know, valuable hours where they're going to make the most impact. And again, all of this information is available in reports. So what may have been difficult to um, you know, get data on previously can, can become just a couple of clicks where a grant awarded report, you can run that for a specific time period uh, and get a list of the all of the awards um, 
that have been uh, awarded to the county within the last three months, the last six months, whatever that date period is. So we've got 34 grants for 171 million uh, spread out across various departments. So that access to information is a real game changer. It allows for more um, focused decision making and knowing where to put your efforts where they'll really make uh, the most impact. All right. Aaron, Celeste, I will Thank pass you. it back over to you. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Questions? All right, any questions from the board members? Uh, yes, how long has this group been in uh, existence? Ryan, the question was how long have you been in existence? Um, E-Civis was begun in 2000, so we've been around for 22 years. How many other states do you work with? How many other states do you work with? Um, we, that's a good question. Um, I believe we may have representation in every state. There may be a couple I'm not aware of, but we are a national company. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you all participate with NACO, the National Association of County Officials? Do you participate? Yes, we. Oh. Oh, yeah. I, I heard that one. Yes, um, <laughs> we are going to NACO. I'm actually going there myself. So if you're going, I hope to see you there. We are also members of NACA, the National Association of County Administrators, and we participate in that organization as well. Okay. So how many counties in Georgia do you work with? Aaron, do you have I, that? I know of Glenn. I, yeah, I, I know of Glenn County. I could find that information out, but I don't have that in front of me. Is that it for you? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Commissioner yes, thank you all for this presentation. Um, grant funding is definitely extremely important. Uh, I don't know if the question, thank you, you did an excellent job. Thank you. They need to hire you to do the commercials for them. <laughs> <laughs> you said, don't ask me, ask them. <laughs> but let me say this, it's not a question really for, yeah, I'll start with a question for you. When you gave your pr um, presentation earlier, it was we don't find out about grants and grants uh, and how the grant process works. Who is we? Okay, Who's so upon? I'm still wearing both hats because I know I don't work for finance anymore, but I, I'm in OPM. And when I say we, I'm talking about our department, OPM, as well as when I was in finance. Okay. That was a challenge for us. In finance, it was yes. a challenge? Yes, it was a challenge in finance, and it's a challenge here. I think now we're making ourselves known. We're having cluster meetings, so they know to come to us when they're looking for grants, but I know it was a challenge in the past. Okay. So the 25 grants that were received, who applied for those grants? There were different. It was several different departments. So that, that came from the department level? Yes, department Okay, not levels. from the OPM? No. Okay. So that, the grant. And that was in 2019. Okay. So um, that was 2019 and it came from the department level. All right. Um, my other question though, I don't know that I see IT here to be able to answer those questions. So oh. not sure because the bottom line is I know COO is here. Um, and then I'm gonna pivot to our Chief Murkison and a couple others. I've already stated previously, I love the fact that we can do things efficiently and effectively, but um, the concern is with the structure that we currently have, it's almost as if we just, number one, kind of divided out the duties, but yet and still it's like we don't have enough time to do the duties that we've divided out. So I heard in the presentation, it said, well, you know, for people who don't do this every day. So if we weren't doing grants every day uh, within the OPM division, who was managing grants prior to the OPM division? <coughs> That can be answered a couple of ways, Commissioner. I think um, one, <clears throat> grants management under finance tr traditionally has been about ensuring those areas of um, obligation, mm -hmm. meaning that you've met the, the, the components associated with the grant, that you actually are going through what those requirements are. But when it came to that, the management, the boots on the ground, operationalizing that grant, 
that was left to the device of the department to handle that more, most often than not. So the goal was to take OPM using the grant analyst as a, a means to not only figure out ways to bring in additional money because some departments are they much stronger in, in finding grants than other departments. Right. Whether you're talking senior services or fire EMA, they have individuals on the ground that can find those grants. But other departments don't really have the resources within those departments to find them. So the goal was to try to have OPM through the grants analysts to assist with finding those grants. And it would work synergistically with finance department. Finance department, again, will continue to provide an arm about ensuring that the the, the legalities associated with the grants are still being um, administered because they're looking at the financial, the financial threats versus OPM, who's trying to programmatically get those funds out to make sure it's meeting the requests of those respective departments. So they should be working in tandem, um, whether you're talking about grants um, programming on OPM side versus grants management in finance. And I had some preliminary discussions with um, interim CFO um, Stacy Merritt about that very thing. We need to ensure that we're not duplicating efforts. That's we shouldn't concern. be having OPM doing one thing and finance doing something different. Mm -hmm. So I do concur with you wholeheartedly. There has to be some firming up those responsibilities. And also, don't forget this, and I want to make sure that I say this as carefully as I can. I'm glad you mentioned the two uh, departments and the overlapping, but also we have to also be mindful that if we're going to bring another department in a space dealing with programming, then at the end of the day, it's the department directors that are going to be the experts on programming. Because unfortunately, I, 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 you know, we've given it time, but um, the level of awareness has still been a concern. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I'm not saying that this, is, this isn't a valiant effort. I'm not saying that the system doesn't work. But I think that in the words of um, some folks, we may need to go back and go back to the basics of the purpose before we put the cart before the horse. Uh, that is my concern. And I want to bring up Chief Murkison, if you don't mind. Yes, ma'am. Can I add one more thing to that, yeah, Commissioner? Sure. No worries. So, so as it pertains to the structure, one of the things we tried to do is take the, the strategic initiatives of the board from a policy lens to ensure that, in some instances, it's, it's carrying forth that mission. So an example I use, one of the things that Commissioner Anderson has talked about, specifically in Commissioner Hamburg, in some instances, like if we're trying to firm up our quality of life in respective div in, um, districts. So there might be an opportunity to do a pocket park. There might be an opportunity to do enhancements for trails. So now if Ms. Celeste is working with Troy, who's trying to find funding that can't continue to maximize the general fund to get that done, she would work in tandem with Parks and Recreation in identifying grant funding to identify those strategic initiatives that's pushed by the board, and then we can go out and apply for that funding in those areas based upon the request of a commissioner or a strategic plan and working in tandem with that department with OPM. And I think that is definitely um, needed, but I've stated again, you've got to have a better level of awareness if you are working in said space to be able to understand there cannot be a disconnect between PD, fire, or the um, corrections officers. There has to be a clear understanding of what those divisions do. So, but with that, real quick, um, Chief Markison, if you can come up, if you don't mind. How many grants have you all applied for this year and how have you sourced those grants? Our major grants that we have applied for this year. Um, so when you say, are you just, you want me to break that down calendar year? Because we deal with the federal year and then we deal with our fiscal year and then we deal with <laughs> the calendar year. So, so to, to, to keep it simple, okay. um, our immediate ones that we've applied for, both the ones since January have been all been congressionally directed spending grants that we've applied for either through um well all those have gone through senator ossoff's office mm -hmm. um and we did that through um the, the office of opm um, the fema grants that we've applied for the brick funding um the hazard mitigation funding the cap study that the board just approved um through the board i mean um through the army corps of engineers those are going through fema um, that's where that money comes from. It's allocated through the Department of um, Homeland Security, so it has to come down through the FEMA Go portal, um, which that's where all of those opportunities that come down from DHS come through the FEMA Go portal. Um, so that's how we get notified of those, and our primary contact for that is um, Marcus um, over in finance. He's listed as the primary um, on that account, and I believe I'm secondary, and Chief Morrison is third, and we're working with 
Ms. Merritt on getting her up to speed on all of the audits because all of the audits with our FEMA grants have to go through the FEMA Go portal. Um, that's where they require that those get done. So finance handles that for us. Um, our other grants that we apply for, emergency management grants through GEMA um, and some of our hazard mitigation grants through GEMA and then some of the um, hazard, what are they calling it now? Um, it's our um, hazard programming. Um, grants all go through a portal called EM Grants, which is Emergency Management Grants, and that's a state website that's run by GEMA. So those are the two main websites that, that we utilize, and most of our grants that come either from DHS or Health and Human Services in some cases will send stuff through FEMA Go Portal as well, but that's where the vast majority of those come from. All of our other opportunities we source through, obviously, our Emergency Management Association, International Association of Fire Chiefs, um, and then the Georgia Fire Chiefs, a lot of those grants get funneled down through those organizations, and then we apply for those as we meet um, the terms and conditions of the grants, and then we send that data over to OPM so that they're aware of it. Okay, awesome, thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that's all I have there. I know, it's a, I don't wanna go through each other department. I think it's well stated that the department levels have, as you said, have been doing the grants but the grant process is they must bring it before the board and then the board is aware of it and then we give it back to the said department. Um, I just, again, think that we need to go back to um, making sure that we aren't overlapping and that we understand that we have people in said space to be able to have a clear understanding of even the basics of governance within these various departments. For instance, we're working on, a, we have been working on a grant for the Corrections Division, which was brought to us and we even brought in, um, I think it was PD and Sheriff's Office on that one as well. So um, I look forward to a continued conversation and then unfortunately, I'm not able to ask, ask the question tonight, but this county spent a lot of money on a system years ago and yet it's still we gotta buy another system and we gotta apply to another system. And we were told years ago that those various systems would allow us to be able to manage very, what was brought before us tonight. So that's why I was looking for Jason to be able to answer that question, as opposed to constantly buying new modules or a different program that don't coordinate with one another. And just to bring it up, I remember years ago that unfortunately, the finance department, I think you were in here, I was delivering candy to y'all as y'all were trying to get paychecks out because people could not get paid because we had bought a system and they weren't contacting one another. So, great idea. Well, I wasn't here then. You weren't here then. <laughs> I didn't come well, okay. <laughs> okay, but it was in the finance division and it was definitely a disconnect between the IT division and a disconnect between the finance department. I mean, that's on record. So, it's a great effort but we need to go back to the basics, so. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> so to, to, to provide a little context to that, the Munis system, Tyler Munis, speaks to being able to take information in from grants and be able to automate that process. Where the, the likes of an EC service and other types of platforms, it helps identify grants. Right. Versus the Tyler Munis program, don't, they don't, it doesn't identify a grant. It. it helps us manage it once we got it internal to the system. So those, those are the delineations between the two. Okay. okay. We can talk about it further. Yes, Thank you. Do you know how many other people or how many other counties or either uh, local governments are using the Munis system? Oh, wow, that's a good question, Commissioner. Um, in the metro area, I know at one point in time there was at least five or six in the metro area, and all of them had a sundry of success stories and challenges. Um, but it all varied depending upon what modules they were utilizing and ultimately what the return on investment were. So I want to say at least of the 12 metro counties, I know at some point in time it was almost five or six that were using Munis in some form or fashion. Maybe not to the extent that we're utilizing it, but certainly they've had components of Tyler in their system. Are we better? Are we doing better? We're, we're doing better. Um, we're not where we need to be, but we are doing better. All right, let me say this. I uh, appreciate the presentation, a lot of good information. Uh, of course, we will continue to do our due diligence to make sure, to Commissioner Franklin's point, that if we buy a system, it needs to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, and we don't want to duplicate our, our efforts, of course. But this 
board has constantly said that we've left, left a lot of money on the table. And what I'm hearing is that this system will help locate that money that we are leaving on the table. And when it comes to OPM, you know, there is a vital service that y'all provide and managing and locating and uh, helping to apply for those and working with the departments. And I think that's uh, a big effort. That's a change that hasn't been or a big help that has not been uh, done in the past. So I appreciate what y'all are doing. I am looking forward and actually I'm liking what I'm hearing about this system. But again, we need to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. Anytime you can bring money into this county and we don't have to use fund balance for it, I'm on board. But again, it needs to do what it's supposed to do. So well, one additional note. Um uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Vice Chair, and it actually goes to Madam Vice Chair's uh, comment. I think that a lot of times we just don't utilize the resources available to us. East uh, Civis, I'm not saying that um, they wouldn't be able to provide, and they probably could. But um, NACO, ACCG, we're already paying to be members of them. And so there, as Chief even brought up, those organizations have the ability to be able to bring those grants from, for us. So I think that um, where the system definitely, a system like this, not this company per se, because as it was alluded to, I honestly, I'm just gonna let you know, I have to have a little bit more confidence in you all's track record uh, before even considering this particular company. But um, at the end of the day though, when it comes to the system itself, we do need to make sure that we utilize those organizations we're already a member of as opposed to always seeking something new, seeking something new. We don't utilize our membership well. Um, that's not just ACCG and NACO, but ARC, the ATL. They're constantly telling us that. We just started developing that relationship between the ATL and our tax dollars are already paying them and they come in and they have access that we may not even have to go in and purchase additional access that we already have access to. So it's not saying that this isn't useful for what it's providing, but it's stating that we just need to dig a little deeper and make sure that um, there are other opportunities that we're missing. Any other questions or comments? Thank you again for your presentation and Mr. Jones and Baird and I think Ms. Oliver, thank you for being online. Thank you everyone. Thank you. All right, the next item, tax commission expense for the fire fund will not be heard. Uh, the chief has requested some additional time to get some additional information. So we're gonna go into impact fee advisory committee's uh, report. Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, Commissioner Franklin. Um, I did want to bring back um, thank you, Mike. Um, the Formation of the Impact Fee Advisory Committee, as the board um, remembers, we brought forth. I have made several presentations on developmental impact fees for the county. Um, the, the board gave me uh, consent to move forward with um, bringing on Wood Environmental to go through the process um, of developing an impact fee ordinance, um, an update to our community, um, or to create a community improvements element for our comprehensive plan update, and then to bring back before this board um, a proposed resolution um, for you to vote either way um, for the imposition of development impact fees. In order for us to do that, um, there are a few steps that we have to go through per state law. Um, as I went over with you in my previous presentation, the scope of work for Wood is broken down into three main tasks. The first being the impact fee methodology report and capital improvements element. Number two would be drafting and crafting of the impact fee ordinance itself. And then, of course, final adoption and impact fee implementation, which comes with training, um, policy manuals, and such that would guide the oversight and use of the program. So I've highlighted step one because that's where we are. Um, this is the first step since the notice to proceed has gone out, um, and we are ready to get this process started. So per state law, the very first thing that we must do is develop an impact fee advisory committee, and that is per OCGA 36-71.5. Um, the state law lays out how that committee shall be structured. Um, it says it shall have not less than five nor more than 10 members. At least 50% of those members must come from the development, the building, or real estate industry. Um, an existing committee um, that meets the above um, can serve in that capacity, and they are advisory only. They are there to 
do legwork, dig into mountains of tedious and complex information, and provide their industry insight into what's going on around us um, and how we should structure any program um, to bring forth back to the board for consideration. Um, so these are simply recommendations that our consultant has brought forth, and they are typically how these committees are structured. Um, as I said, this is a recommendation only, so I will work through kind of what their recommendations are, and then I'm going to shut up and let y'all hash it out. Um, so here's what they recommend. They recommend that we do um, appoint the maximum of 10, and that is just to ensure that we have a quorum at all meetings. Um, in order to keep this process moving um, and keep us on track with the timelines that I presented to the board, it's important that we have enough members present um, to actually go through the material that they will bring forth. Um, that includes all the public hearings, the public meetings, and public input that has to go along with this process. Um, so one potential recommendation was the first five members, um, one member from each commissioner chosen by the existing guidelines for board appointments that the county has in place. Um, and maybe from the required professional fields. The second five members, there are two options, either at-large appointments, um, or we can simply have two members of the committee um, from each commissioner. Um, the second five must be from the required professional fields and maybe industry experts from outside the county, um, which he actually mm -hmm. recommends um, that we bring in some industry experts that this is what they do, whether that's home builders associations, commercial real estate associations, apartment associations, whatever the case may be. Um, I do know that the, the um, guidelines for county board appointments are that they are county residents, um, but it may be better for at least the second five members to have those come in from other industries or other areas outside of the county. As I said, these are purely recommendations. Um, but the intent of having this conversation was so that Attorney Reed um, would know how to craft a resolution um, formally um, creating the advisory committee and then then subsequently creating those board appointments um, that, that would be placed on there. So I do believe that's the gist of it. It's not overly complicated. The state says what it has to be um, and who has to be there. So at, at this point, it is the board's will um, as to how you would like to meet that objective. So with that, I will pause and answer any questions you may have. So if I recall, well, I just said it, 10 members each, <clears throat> five from the commissioners. And those five, my <coughs> preference will be the citizens from Clayton County and the other five industry experts to comprise the 10 board. Uh, would this be a, I guess that would be up to us, a policy decision in reference to whether or not this would be paid positions or not? Or does the state say that they can't not be paid? It doesn't mention it in the Developmental no. Impact Fee Act, whether mm -hmm. it's a paid board or a non-paid. I think that would be the mm -hmm. board's discretion. Well, I probably would say it'd have to be a state law that mm -hmm. says that they are required to be paid because uh, typically the way that boards, when they are being paid, they are dictated by stipend, either by a local law or from the state saying that they, this is what we're setting the um, amount to be. And one just asterisk to put next to that is that your standing procedural rules that you have now say that um, that when there's five or multiples of five, each of you all have two people to provide. So um, so you all can decide in the, in the language specifically says that you all appoint. So you can have a recommendation from a outside vendor but the actually appointing commissioner will be that you know appointing commissioner so it wouldn't be you know greater atlanta home builders associates saying okay we're going to put this person here mm -hmm. they would come to you and say here's our recommendation and you would mm -hmm. do like you do similar to the ethics board or right. anything else questions uh first of all i want to say thank you so much for doing this i don't think the citizens really realize that this project that you picked up in working with um, others was not something that normally would rest with a, um, a chief of fire or a, um, what's that other title, the resiliency <laughs> officer? Resiliency <laughs> officer, yes. Why are you laughing at me, Metal Vice Chairman? <laughs> <laughs> the resiliency officer. 
This is something that normally would be recommendations that would have come from um, if it was another company, a finance director, as options for us to be able to uh, provide services to the citizens. So I want to make sure that that's on record because you're going above and beyond to do something where we have a whole other division. No offense to you because you just got in the role. But I think that's clear that people need to understand that. And then I want to thank this board for um, jumping on board, <laughs> not, no pun intended, because I know that some folks had some questions. But now we're moving into the 20th century. And this is a heavy lift. And this board unanimously voted to support this effort, which is going to change the future of our county for many, many years to come and generations to come. So I want to commend you on the work that you're doing for picking this up and doing this. Because any other county, this would have been presented through the finance division. So um, I don't want to miss my words when I say that. The second thing is to answer the chairman too. Y'all did it excellently. But because of the way this board is made up, I don't recommend that they're paid because then we could end up getting into some type of gratuity issues or something like that because you're dealing with the uh, experts in those fields and they may be having things come before this board that need to be voted on, i.e. zoning and so forth. So that's why I would guess, I'm only guesstimating, that it wasn't in the state statute because then you get into that space to where um, it's a little bit kind of a uh, gray area. Um, so uh, with that being stated, I'm just excited to keep going. This is one that we didn't have on the table for a year. You, you said, I will do it, jumped up and did it, and now we are moving forward. So I'm just looking forward to getting this done yes, for the people of this county. Uh, yes, what is our next step? So, so the next step will be once the board decides how you want the committee structured mm -hmm. um, as far as two appointments per commissioner or, or however you choose to get to a number of 10 mm -hmm. so long as 50 percent of those meet that requirement um, attorney reed will craft that resolution to formally create that committee and then those board appointments will appear on the following agenda after the resolution or is that a simultaneous i don't, I don't want to speak for your <coughs> your legal process <laughs> Well, I suppose that uh, depending on how it falls on the agenda, you could have it where if it's adopted or approved by the board that then on the uh, agenda for that, you could have those spots to mm -hmm. be filled. But I don't know quick how fast if you would have somebody already ready to, you know, have someone already appointed the same day that you adopt the creation of the committee. So it probably wouldn't hurt to adopt it at the next meeting, then list however many people you have and, and to chime in with uh, what the chief says, we just need to know if you want 10 or some other amount lower than 10, so that I know how many people to put in. I mean, not that you would vote on that, but just kind of get a sense of what you all are looking for. If you say 10 is the number, that's how many I'll put in the ordinance, I mean, into the resolution to bring for you all to vote on. And I guess we also need to think about the length of service, the term. To the project's term, right? Yeah, that um, would likely be until the they come up with a, it, the um, recommendations. So it wouldn't be, I mean, there's a time frame for how this would all come back, but it, it's, go ahead. Yes, sir. So typically when these committees are created, their, their terms or appointments run until the county adopts, either adopts the impact fee program through a resolution um, or it, it chooses not to move forward. Um, once, the, once the resolution is in place and the program goes into effect, the committee has no further involvement in any of it until such time as those impact fees get ready to be reassessed mm -hmm. um, or re-looked at, and typically that's um, in a five-year increment along with the comprehensive plan. So at that point in time, we would reconvene a committee um, for the purpose of looking at that. So if you look at the update that Atlanta just did, th their impact fee committee went dormant for about 10 years, I believe, and then they brought it back to go through the refreshing of their program and their fees. Um, their committee is staying in place. I believe they did their updates in a three-year phased implementation. Um, so they didn't do 100% because in some cases their fees tripled. 
right? Mm -hmm. So rather than taking a, a hotel units, for example, they went from about $1,500 per room in a hotel for the fee to almost 4000 mm -hmm. um, is what the fee will be. So they've phased it in 50% year one, 75% year two, 100% year three. So that was a three year phase in. So once that is done, that committee will be disbanded. I got you. Mm -hmm. um, so that the term won't necessarily be like a year or a two. I got you. It'll be until the board Projects makes its final percent. determination, which right now we're on about a 10 and a half month timeline. Perfect. Assuming we, we hit all the board meetings. So this is the first of about six of these conversations we will have. Um, to get through this process with presentations and then board action that's required because there's multiple steps that we have to do in succession. Um, so this is just literally the very beginning of a 10 to 11 month process depending on how we can hit board meetings. So, real quick, can you go back to the um, breakdown and this would be to uh, Chuck Reed's uh, question to the board. The breakdown of the members it was five and five i just want to look at that slide again did they leave us oh. Where did, uh, IT help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right if he, broke, if he touches them then he can say he <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and while get, we're waiting while we're <laughs> waiting well uh Madam Vice Chair was laughing. You know, don't forget the Chief Resiliency Officer was put in place to help find grants. That was your under your mm -hmm. job That's title, true. I think. I think that went under the other assigned duties part. Down there. I thought it did. <laughs> uh, and then using IT. And, and while we're waiting too, uh, and I believe on on the future agenda, we're going to have something uh, where the different boards will come in and. You know, mm -hmm. let us know what they do, how often they meet, those kind of things. Because I have appointed a couple people on some boards that I've never met. Mm -hmm. And I know those appointments were made well yes, over a year ago. So I don't want this to be one of those boards. Yes, ma'am. That will lay dormant, as uh, Chief was saying, that the Atlanta board did for a while. Um, <clears throat> Attorney Reed, and working with um, our clerk, um, Ms. Russian, we talked about getting together to talk about the orientation and having those boards come out and present in a work session as well. So you should see some of that forthcoming in the next couple of work sessions as well. Okay. Also, Mr. CO, if I could read, if you don't mind, get you to address. I heard Madam Vice Chair say something about dormancy. Maybe you all need to define what the dormancy is because it wasn't that they weren't doing what they needed to do. If you could just so right. we understand, because this so, is all new for us. So, so as it pertains specifically to the impact fee committee with the city of Atlanta, as chief was referring to, it went dormant because there was no quote unquote activity for the, the, the committee to kind of intervene around. But as they end up ginning back up to, to re, either reconstitute their impact fees, then that committee was reconvened in that, in, that, in, in that respective instance. But in our space, we do recognize in some instances that there's been a while that some of the boards and committees have not reported out to the Board of Commissioners in a while. So we do know that we need to bring them before you so we can talk about the activities of those boards and committees. And are we still getting the minutes? Sometime mm. back, some years back, we said that we wanted to get minutes yeah. from the board the, the, meetings. The, the clerk gave me the, the skittish sign. <laughs> so that so in some instances we are, in some instances we're not. Mm -hmm. So I think that goes back to, again, about the orientation of those boards and show that the, the, the executive leadership in those spaces understand that they need to um, submit that information so that we can have a timely report back to this board and to our citizens. Okay. And that's, oh, I'm sorry. I, mean no, I was, I was just going to say, and I think with them, the different boards coming, giving short presentations and all that will help as Definitely. a reminder of them yes, along with the training so okay. i agree um the only thing i have about this board is i do like the fact that um we got the maximum and the five will come from each um district and then of course one at large uh for each board for the board member uh here but the balance of it for me i wouldn't want experts who may or may not live in the county to outweigh those who live in the county for this uh, decision so my my just uh, right off you know thoughts based upon what you presented and what we've been working through and learning uh, is I would probably look more at a seven board uh, mm -hmm. member board and then five from each commissioner and then if it's okay within the state use the three that will be at large as experts outside of the county is that something we can do 
So the statute says that 50% of the members have That's to be. That's the part I forgot. Thank right. you. Right. So um, now, again, you all will be determining who gets appointed. So as I said, it won't be as if a industry expert comes and says, well, I'm going to put myself on this board. You all have control over who goes on the board. The only issue is that 50% of them have to be from that particular Thank you uh, industry. Me. And that's why I wanted this. I forgot about that part. So we need to probably just stick with what you have, to be honest. Well, and, and once again, yes, Commissioner, um, it, all 10 of them can, can, can be from that, right? So if mm -hmm. I'm quite sure there's builders, developers, real estate agents that are county residents that would love to be a part of this, all 10 can be from that industry. There, there's there's okay. no... There's no maximum. All the, the only thing the state dictates is that 50% of them are. So we then still can do the seven, just as long as it's 50%. Right. That sounds doable. Well, at least four, I guess. Yeah, at least four. At, at that point, keep the only reason they're suggesting we maximize at 10 is to make sure that we always have enough to do the work. I Understanding you. that this is going to be an 11-month process. We're going to go through you. holidays. We're going to go through a lot of periods where there will be travel, and I don't. I don't want to have to come back before you and say we can't do any work because we don't have enough the committee members. And okay. And the committee is required to be present um, for a lot of the work that we do. So the very first thing we have to do is file this committee structure with DCA um, mm -hmm. and let them know that, hey, here's the committee, here's their, their credentials, and this is kind of how we're, we're going down this, this, this track. So that's, that's why we just set it at 10 to make sure we can always do the work. Gotcha. Well, setting it at 10 also makes sure that each commissioner has a selection. Duly noted. Two selections per person. Two. Duly noted. Any other questions, comments? Great work. Appreciate the work and look forward to uh, further discussions. Thank you, sir. All right. That was the last presentation for the day. You say something, Commissioner? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Before, before you join the meeting I made a couple notes um, on some other things some other recommendations for uh, possible uh, well one recommendation uh, and I think I mentioned this to you and maybe we can just talk off you know outside about the contractors and all for the cleaning the possibility of contractors you know I talked with someone out of Richmond County said that they were doing what we were doing in the past and now they do something a little bit differently and how much better um, the area is looking so I don't know you want to do mm -hmm. that all? yes ma'am okay. Com Commissioner Hambrick is speaking directly to um, when we talk about our quality of life initiative there are some municipalities that um, utilize street cleaners or, or utilize uh, resources that will go through you know designated areas especially high traffic or, or high visible areas that we may have problems in to ensure that the cleanliness is at the level we like to like for it to be I love that idea. and so um, she's asked us to look into some options um, to figure out how we can bring that to bear and so um, I'll bring bring it back some additional recommendations to this board about how we make that work okay that's okay. an excellent idea anything else uh, Commissioner Amber? Mm -hmm. Because we can use small business owners for that. That's an excellent mm -hmm. idea. I just have two th um, things we're going to want to share real quick, just some announcements. Clayton County actually was on the um, national, I guess, exposure level with Kaiser. As we know, Kaiser is one of our largest providers in the county, and they have their largest hospital here. Um, and Kaiser actually sponsored an event, and um, it was during Juneteenth, and it has been well received. And because of that, uh, Kaiser has been sharing that information and they're excited about uh, having it happen again uh, and it was great because to um, a lot of things we discussed it deals with uh, not only our community health but our community outcomes within our community within <laughs> our family so that's the first thing secondly on that same day through um, sickle cell awareness United Healthcare actually provided over $50,000 within our community to help those families deal with sickle cell. And um, that was amazing. And then from there, we've received additional phone calls from them on a national level about coming in and working more with the community. So we're going to follow up with that uh, as well. And I just thought that those were a couple of things that were important to share with the community as uh, we move forward. And then the final thing that 
I got to share. I went today to one of the business owners. I want you all to look up HG2. HG2 is a company that I see some folks back there smiling, uh, and I think PD might be smiling. They're a company that is well known out of the Orlando area. And HG2 actually um, relocated to Clayton County and District 3. And what they do is outfit all of the vehicles for various first responders uh, from Florida all the way down, all the way up to Georgia. And um, we were able to help them with the zoning and they even purchase land. When I went by there today, they went from doing business just with the sheriff's office. And I got to give Sheriff Hill and y'all kudos for that, for bringing them, um, for exposing them here. And now Shaq and all everybody else use them. But I looked in that parking lot in little old Clayton County. Sounded like Elder Bill, huh? Little old Clinton County, District 3. I saw Cobb County cars. I saw Rockdale County cars. I saw Henry County cars. I saw um, oh, DeKalb County. They're all doing business right here in Clayton County because of that company. And I just thought that deserves some recognition today with all of y'all here. All right, anything else? Right, we stand adjourned. Thank you.